what a lot of people don't realize when they come to my office, I hear a lot of the time, we don't have that much money. Things are pretty simple. I think we just need a will. Many people don't realize there are some downsides that come with having a will, and it doesn't accomplish as much as you might think. Welcome to Financially Ever After Widowhood, the podcast where we empower women to take control of their financial future after the loss of a spouse. I'm your host, Stacey Francis, President and CEO of Francis Financial, an award-winning and nationally recognized financial advisory firm. With the help of incredible guests, I'm ready to guide you through this challenging transition. I'm so excited to have Laura Cowan here today, who is an estate planning attorney and has her own business. In fact, she is the second highest ranked attorney here in New York, but get this, out of 850 lawyers. That's pretty impressive. She also was voted a rising star by super lawyers, not only in 2019, 2021 and 2022. You've probably seen her before. She's been featured by Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, been on NBC and others. And she recently had a special speaking engagement at none other than the United Nations, speaking about estate planning issues for non-citizen spouses. I'm so happy to have Laura here with us today because she's going to be going over the ins and outs of wills, trusts, power of attorneys, and healthcare proxies. And make sure you stay to the end because she gives very important information that you need to know in how to choose the right guardian for your children if, God forbid, you pass away before they are adults. So without further ado, please help me welcome our special guest today, Laura Cowan. Hi, Laura. I know that you talk about this stuff every single day and you absolutely love it. I am so excited to have you here today talking about estate planning because I know that this is what you live and breathe every day. And and welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I do sort of live and breathe it every day. With a lot of people we've been able to help. And yeah, so I'm excited to talk about this. I want to go ahead and just do some myth busting and get your opinion specifically. I feel like there's a myth that if you have assets or income below a certain level that you don't really need an estate plan. So tell me what you think about that. Yeah, this is a really common myth and it's a hard hurdle to get over because so many people really, really do believe that. But estate planning, there's a couple of things. One is that You might think that you don't have an estate plan if you don't have a will, which is most people, or you don't have a trust, which is most people, but you do. It's just that Mm -hmm. the state of New York has written it for you. Every state's got their own sort of default laws about what happens if someone passes away or becomes incapacitated without having written up a will. That's your current estate plan. Now, you probably won't like it if I were to tell you what that plan was, you know, you probably wouldn't be all that happy with it. So estate planning is sort of opting out of this default plan for you and your assets. And so then the question is, what's the default plan? And the default plan is, for example, if you've got minor children, then a court is going to decide who's guardians of your minor children. And your assets are just going to be distributed according to state law. And Everything is going to go to your kids outright without any protections in place and things like that. And so most people don't want these things. Yeah. But that's what you have right now. So estate planning is getting documents in place that override these default rules. The default rules, do they vary according to state to state? So there might be a default in New York that could be subtly different than, let's say, a default in California or Wyoming or Washington state. They do vary state to state, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize, that every state's got their own laws regarding wills and property and what happens when someone passes away, and so they are different by state. So whatever state you're sitting in, you're listening from, you're going to want to work with an attorney who's licensed in your particular state because they'll be able to help you plan based on your state rules. Got it. So what if 
someone saying, but I really don't have much in assets. You know, I have $20,000 in my IRA. I've got $10,000 in a bank account. I might even have $5,000 of credit card debt and $10,000 of student loans. And I don't have any children. Can that person even benefit from a will? Does it make sense for them to? Definitely, because the question is, where do you want that money to go? Yeah, especially gone? if you don't and have you children, don't... right? So it's not as uh, as much of a no-brainer. Right. In fact, I find that planning for non-married people is oftentimes more complicated and takes more time than planning for married people because you're not just leaving everything to the spouse and then down to the children. So if you don't have a spouse and you don't have a lot of money, there's a couple of things. First of all, who do you want to be in charge of wrapping up your affairs when you're gone? Who do you want to be your executor? Do you want that money to go to a friend or a favorite charity? You know, you want to name name your beneficiaries. And then there's other things that are important, not just in terms of what happens when you pass away, but, you know, you mentioned the $10,000 in the bank accounts. What happens if you become incapacitated and you're not able to make either health or financial decisions for yourself? Yeah. Well, if you don't have, for example, a healthcare proxy or a power of attorney in place, nominating someone to make those decisions for you, then someone's going to have to go to court to get permission to make medical and financial decisions for you. And that's going to eat up that $10,000 that you have sitting in your bank account. So oftentimes as people with not a lot of money who need planning the most, because if something goes wrong, yeah. they're not going to have the resources to deal with it. They don't necessarily have the same wiggle room of all these additional legal fees, thousands, even tens of thousands of dollars because the planning didn't happen. You know, they don't necessarily have that for them. That's a good way of putting it, wiggle room. I like that. <laughs> yeah, not, not a whole lot. So let's talk about if you become incapacitated. I'll be honest that most people don't think that this is ever going to happen to them. And I was reading a statistic today that one out of three individuals during their working life are going to become disabled at some point. It doesn't necessarily mean incapacitated, but it is much more common than we ever hope to think about. And if you become incapacitated and are in, let's say, a coma or unable to pay your bills, unable to make healthcare decisions, can you talk a little bit more about those documents and what they can do for you to make sure that financial affairs are being taken care of and that your healthcare decisions that you want or don't want made are also being honored. Yeah. So there's two parts of estate planning. You know, one is what happens when you pass away. And then the other is, well, what happens if you're alive but unable to make your own decisions? And those are healthcare decisions and also financial decisions. And so the documents that everyone should have in place are a healthcare proxy where you pick someone that you know and trust to make medical mm -hmm. decisions for you if you can't make them yourself. Most people name their spouse. And then if you want to name a couple of backups, you know, that's great. And then in the a financial power of attorney is a similar document, but it's for all of your property. So someone that you trust completely to do things like pay your bills, manage your finances, file your income taxes in the event that you can't do it yourself. And this is another place where it helps to step back and to say, well, what would happen if I were incapacitated and I didn't yeah. have these documents in place? And what would happen is that someone, a family member, a friend, somebody would have to go to court to get permission. Most people tend to think, especially if you're married, they tend to think, well, my spouse would just automatically be able to make those decisions for me. And it's not necessarily true. And it's going to depend on what state you live in. But it's going to be expensive for someone in your family to go get permission from a judge to make medical or financial decisions for you. So the way to get around that is for you to nominate these people now in these documents so that you have them if it happens. I have a few questions about that. I mean, what does the process look like of having to go to a court? Is it, you know, you make an appointment, you go in the same week? I imagine not. What is the time delay on those cases where you see someone hasn't done the planning? Yeah, I mean, it would probably be a few months and you would have to hire an attorney and they would have to get on the court calendar and they'd go through a conservatorship proceeding of some kind, which is going to be expensive. And it's yeah. a public proceeding, mm -hmm. which is something else a lot of people don't think about. So again, we're, you know, we're trying to avoid having to go to court for any reason. And the way to avoid that is 
simply yeah. to get a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney in place. So talking about the healthcare proxy, if if you have someone in mind who you really trust that could make medical decisions for you in place of you, and often we think of our spouse, but if we don't necessarily have a spouse and we are single, can you name a friend? Who are the right people that you feel play that role the best way? Yeah, so the healthcare proxy, you can nominate anyone, anywhere mm-hmm. in the world, right? Some of these roles, you have to be more specific, but the healthcare proxy can just be any friend or family member that you trust to make yep. decisions on your behalf. It doesn't have to be someone that you're related to. It doesn't have to be someone who lives in the same town. It can really be anybody in the world. And it's important to name your first choice. And then just in case they're not available, I mean, name a couple of backups. There's no downside to having some backups as well. And they don't necessarily have to have health care background. My understanding in those documents, you're just really laying out for them. Do you want to have resuscitation? Do you not want resuscitation? It sounds almost as if that what you're doing is you're trying to give them a recipe to follow for all different types of eventuality so that they are able to make the decisions in a confident way. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The healthcare proxy is just you nominating someone to make these choices for you. They don't have to have medical knowledge. They'll speak to the doctors on your behalf. And then depending on what state you live in, all of the forms are different in each state. So some states you'll be able to fill out, this is what I would want to have happen in these certain instances. And then other states, they don't go into that much detail, which is another reason why it's important to work with an attorney licensed in your state, because they're going to know what the form is for your state. Exactly. Can you ever have two people? Let's say you have two children that you want to both be agents for the healthcare proxy. Is that a possibility as well? Not in New York. In New York, you're not allowed to have co-agents for the healthcare proxy. You've got to pick just one at a time. But some of the other roles, like the financial power of attorney, for example, that one you can name co-agents or you can have co-executors for your will. Some of the roles you can name co and some of them you have to just name one person at a time. And actually, I'm going to ask that same question on the power of attorney, someone that would be dealing with the financial matters in your incapacity. They don't necessarily need to be financially experienced or any type of credentials. They essentially are there to help make sure that the bills are paid, to make sure that, you know, everything continues as as normal and don't necessarily need to have a a financial expertise. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, unless you're sort of running a business or you've got complicated financial things that are going on, but most people don't, right? Most yeah. people just want someone who this person's okay to pay bills through my account. They're okay to file my income taxes to do the same things with your property that you would do if you were incapacitated. The most important thing about the financial power of attorney is picking someone that you trust because they're going to have the same power over your assets that you have. And that's actually a good question to ask. So when that form is filled out, does their power to make financial decisions for you and move money only occur after you're incapacitated? Or do they have that power from the day that that form has been signed. You can pick, right? There's a couple of different options. You can either choose to have your agent have these powers immediately upon execution. So as soon as it's signed and notarized, boom, they've got the powers. Or you can have what's called a springing power. And that means that the power doesn't spring into effect until you're actually incapacitated. So they would only act in the unlikely event that you were unable to act for yourself. So that's one of the things you'll discuss with the attorney. Who do you want to name? And then what powers do you want them to have? And when do you want them to have those powers? It's interesting because I can see that different situations could merit different right answers. And I'm just thinking about a lot of our clients right now where their parents are updating their estate planning documents and they're starting to see signs of dementia. And so that decision of whether or not they have powers at that point now or just when they become incapacitated. And we're seeing more of our clients have powers now so that they can just help mom. They can help her with some of the banking. They can help ease the transition for her so that it doesn't have to be a kind of 
all or nothing, not able to have that role until they are truly incapacitated, you know, and at that right. point. Yep, that's really common with elderly people. The grown-up children will have the power of attorney just to help because having a doctor actually make the declaration that, okay, she is incapacitated, you know, that can be a little bit of a hurdle to get over. And sometimes you just want one of the adult kids to be able to help with the bills and things like that. It's a client-by-client -client decision. Yeah, and I can imagine that would be a little demoralizing of, you know, having to have a doctor say, yes, you are incapacitated and, you know, having to realize that it doesn't matter how with it or you know not with it you are just you understand what those words mean so we've talked about who is a good person to be the healthcare proxy and why that's so important for making sure that you have medical decisions that are made in your interest and in your honor and then we've also talked about bill paying and making sure that they can get access to accounts through a power of attorney on the financial side tell me about who an ideal executor is this is my myth too, but being an executor of an estate, I feel like there are some characteristics that you really do want to look for in this person, such as good follow-up, good with details, you know, financially responsible. Tell me more about that because I consider these are all important roles, but the executor role I see can be a really work-intensive role. Yeah. So the executor is the person that you nominate in your will as the person who's going to sort of wrap up all of your affairs when you're gone. If you're doing a living trust as opposed to a will, the job is a successor trustee, but it's the same role. And you're right. This person is going to be working with the attorney. They're going to be responsible for gathering information about the assets and information about the family. And it is going to be a somewhat long process. So you do want to pick the right person for that job. Just like you said, you know, attention to detail, being somewhat familiar with money type things. I mean, the, the attorney's going to guide them through, but mm -hmm. yeah, you want to spend some time thinking about the best person for that job. And then again, the documents will allow you to nominate your first choice and then a second and a third if your first mm -hmm. choice isn't available. So yeah, and you can name co-executors if you want as well. So if you've got two grown children and you want them to act together, you can name them both. And if you just want to name one, you can do that too. Yep. And you actually brought something up, which I feel like is a fantastic segue to our next topic. You talked a little bit about a trust. So how does a trust differ than a will? And in what role can trust play to make sure that your money is distributed and taken care of the way that you intend it to? There's different kinds of trusts and they all do different things. The best comparison between a, a will and a trust, but a lot of people don't realize when they come to my office, I hear a lot of the time, we don't have that much money. Things are pretty simple. I think we just need a will. Many people don't realize there are some downsides that come with having a will and it doesn't accomplish as much as you might think. So some of the downsides are it actually has to go through probate. I find that people... They think, well, if I get a will, I'm going to avoid all the court stuff. Isn't that the whole point? But it's the opposite. If you die with a will, it's going to have to go through the probate court process before all of your money can be distributed. And there's some downsides to the probate process. It can be expensive. It can take a long time. It's a public process, which many mm -hmm. people don't realize. You know, so, your so, will, so you that was... means that people can go up and, and see how much money you had or didn't have. Yeah, which surprises a lot of people. Because you think of your will as being so private. Yeah. But then you die and it gets filed out of the courthouse and anyone can go look at it. So those are some downsides. And I walk my clients through those downsides. And if any of those downsides bother them, then we talk about a living trust. A living trust is like a will. It's a will substitute. But the benefit is that everything that's owned in the trust, when you pass away, it goes out to your family without having to go through the probate process. Uh -huh. So... Uh -huh. You know, I explain both options to my clients and they can choose which one makes most sense for them. But most of my clients choose a trust and they don't necessarily have a lot of money. It's just yeah. that if you want your family to have to minimize the hassle when you're gone, a trust is going to do that better. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because we have both. So we have a will and it governs our assets for anything that is outside of our living will our trust. And in the living will slash trust, what we have is we have our house, we have our vacation home, 
We have our brokerage account. So the brokerage account, actually the title is Revocable Trust for Stacy and Michael Francis. So that's the name of it, as well as a few other assets. And we then can choose who the beneficiaries are. And so how these assets are going to be distributed upon our death. And again, that's what a will does too. But typically I, I see that the will often will govern assets that are a little harder to maybe transfer, maybe not able to go into a trust. You know, maybe that might be maybe a car, things like that, maybe personal use assets, but then the rest of the assets trying to go to that trust to protect privacy, but then also that you'll save tens of thousands potentially even in legal costs because probate does take some time. So we've talked a little bit about using a trust to have privacy, also ease of distribution, not having to go through probate. If you have young children, can you use trust as well to make sure that if you pass away when they're still minors, that that money isn't going to go out to them outright, that it can go to a trust and then be able to be distributed to them how you want it to be over time? Yeah, yeah. So that's the next The next question is, you know, the first decision my clients have to make is, do I want to do a will and do I want to do a living trust, right? And once you've chosen one or the other, then the next question is, who do you want to receive your money when you're gone and, and how and when? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Without any estate plan at all, your kids are going to inherit everything outright at 18, which is the that is so scary. My inherit. son is 17. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even imagine. Cannot. Imagine. I know he's a good kid, even, but still, that's what I was going to say. Even the most responsible, hardworking 17 yeah. year old is your 18 year old is not going to manage that well. That's the plan that you have now if you've not done estate planning. So the way to get around that is to set up another trust within your estate plan that springs into existence after you pass away. And that's going to be a document that sort of governs how and when your children inherit. And maybe you just say they get it all outright, not at 18, but at 25. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you'll say they get a third at 21, a third at 25. You know, you've got some different options there. But that's trust planning as well, allowing you to put in some guardrails yep. for how and when your kids inherit. And so having that set up, who manages that money? Who oversees that? And also when Sebastian, my son, says, you know what? I really want to buy this Jeep, but it's not just a Jeep. It's a restored World War II Jeep, and it would be great for me to have. And by the way, it's $80,000. FYI, we, we actually have had this conversation because he loves history. And he thought that, you know, since he's getting his driver's license, I might as well have something that has historical significance. And so we started looking at them and he was like, he is not getting a World War II restored Jeep. Just throwing that out there. But if we weren't around, you bet, Laura, he would. So how do we make sure that he's not going into that trust and using the money for overly expensive Jeep, even though it has a huge amount of history. <laughs> I love it. The way that you do that is you are going to pick a trustee and okay. that's going to be the person who is in charge of the money and they're going to be in charge of doling it out according to whatever rules you've put in place, right? Okay. So maybe the trust says if he needs a car, we can use money for the trust to buy a car, but not an $80,000 Jeep from World War II or whatever it was. Yeah. You're going to pick the trustee and they're going to make those decisions for you. Okay. And you can actually kind of give them a guidepost of like college education, home down payment savings, things like that, so that they feel like they have the tools to understand how you would want that money to be used. Yeah. You can give your trustee guidelines and you know you can say this is fine to spend money on private school, for example, as opposed to you know just public or... Yeah, you know, it's fine yep. to make a distribution for a wedding to start a business. You can put rules in there. Yep. Now, this person who is a trustee, do they have to understand investing, the stock market, the bond market, or are they able to work with an outside professional to manage the money inside? They can, and I would recommend that if you're a trustee and you're now in charge of money for someone else, 
that's the time to hire someone like you to come in and just give guidelines on how the money should be invested and just to, you know, walk them through it because most of us aren't financial professionals. We want to do the right thing. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you can't bring in experts to help you manage it. That's great. And I think that that is really important to know too, because trustee is another big role in addition to executor and trustee having that place. I feel like a lot of individuals when they are asked shy away because they don't feel like financial experts. They don't feel like investment experts, but many people don't realize that that doesn't have to be your role. Your role is to hire a really good company. People that you trust will do a great job investing in a prudent way. And I have to say right now we've already identified four different people, the agent for a healthcare decisions agent for power of attorney on the financial decisions. We talked about an executor and a trustee. That's a lot of people. We also want backups. Do you see in uh, certain estate planning strategies that some people play several roles as well? Yes. Yeah, definitely. And then don't forget the guardian if you've got minor children. So there's that role as well. And yeah, oftentimes the same person will play multiple roles. And that's why it's important to have backups because then yeah. God forbid one of those people dies before you or they're just not able to act for some reason, they'll just go to the next person on the list. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, I know we're coming up to the end, but two things. I want to hear more about what are the factors to think about when you're choosing a guardian? Does it matter if the guardian is living here in the US or if they're living abroad, all those pieces? So when you're talking to a client and they're unsure who is the right guardian to choose if, God forbid, I pass away and my children need to be taken care of. What are some of the things you ask them to think about? Yeah, so there's a few things. They can be people who live anywhere in the world, right? They don't have to be in the U.S. They don't have to be U.S. citizens. If you're, all of your family lives in France, you're allowed to name your family in France. The court's going to go by the best interest of the child standard, so it can be anybody. And what I recommend is don't necessarily pick the person in your family who has the most money. It's going to be your job to hopefully leave behind life insurance and other assets that will be available to take care of the children. Pick someone who's got the same morals and values that you would want to pass on to your children. And then think as well about if you're nominating your sister, for example, and let's say she's married, you want to ask yourself, well, if there was a divorce or if one of them passed away, you know, would you want your sister acting alone if she was divorced? Or would you want it going on to the another sister who's still married? What would happen in the event of yeah. their divorce? So think about those things as well. And is there the magic age where, you know, my child is now 17 or 18? Do we need to name a guardian? Like, when is the age where guardians don't matter as much? Well, 18 in New York is the age that you're legally considered an adult. So, you know, even if your kids are older, again, going back to, well, what would happen if you passed away without naming guardians? A judge is going to pick them for you and yeah. they're going to do the best that they can, but they're not going to know what you would have wanted because you didn't get it down in writing. So I always tell anyone who's a parent of minor children, at a minimum, you should have a will in place because the will is the document where you nominate legal guardians. And if Got you go it. with the trust, then you'll nominate legal guardians and the pour over will, which you were referencing earlier. This is fantastic. But I know a lot of people out there listening want to know, okay, how do I find a good estate planning attorney that's going to help me with my unique situation and also the state that I live in and the laws mm -hmm. of that particular state? So how do you find a good estate planning attorney? And I feel lucky because I know you and I've been able to get to know some really fantastic people who have been working with our clients, but I'm in a very privileged position because I get to interact with some really special, smart people. But your average person who is working in corporate America, they're not running into trusted state attorneys on a <laughs> monthly or even yearly basis. Yeah, this, the things that I would think about, you know, first of all, you do need to find someone who's licensed in a state that you live in. I would look for an attorney that charges a flat fee. There's no reason that this it should be billed by the hour, right? They can just quote you a fee and then that's it. Find an attorney who if you're looking to meet 
via Zoom or in person or whatever your specific preferences are. And then check their online ratings as well. All of these attorneys have got Google My Business profiles and Yelp profiles. You'll find the ratings are different. You know, some attorneys have got better ratings than others. So do a little bit of homework. But yeah, find someone who charges a flat fee who's willing to sort of take the time to explain the documents yep. for you. And the other piece of advice I would give is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So it's common to think, kind of what we talked about in the beginning, I don't really need these documents. So I think most of the time after people come into my office for the initial meeting, they leave knowing, and this must happen with you a lot as well, like, oh, there's a lot of things that I wasn't thinking about. And yeah. so now I'm glad that I've got someone just to answer some of the basic questions for me. Yeah. I find so many people will come to us and say, you know, my, my situation is very straightforward. Okay. And then you realize it is not straightforward. <laughs> It's very rare that situations are truly, truly straightforward, especially if there's children and things like that. Laura, how can our listeners learn more about you? And if you want to talk a little bit about your practice and then how they can contact you. Yeah, so I'm licensed in New York. And so that means I can work with anyone who lives in New York State. And the best way to learn more about my firm and my process is just to go to my website, which I presume you'll you'll drop it in the yeah, we'll put that right in the show notes. Yeah, so you'll just go to my website and then there'll be a link on my website to book what we call a peace of mind planning session. And this is an initial consultation. It'll happen via Zoom. You'll talk about your goals and your concerns and I'll answer your questions. And then we'll talk about your different options, a will, yep. a trust, kind of answer all your questions there. And then we'll go over our fees and our process that if you decide that you want to move forward, that's great. And if not, that's fine too. So the first step is always just to book that peace of mind planning session and we'll waive the fee for anyone who comes in through your show. That's fantastic. Well, Laura, thank you so much. And for all of you listening, yes, we will definitely have in the show notes below all of Laura's contact information, as well as a link to her website. So you can learn a little bit more and just want to say a great big thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And if you don't live in New York, I'm happy to make a referral as well. So feel free to reach out. And I've got a network of attorneys all over the country. So I'm happy to help for people who don't live in New York as well. But yeah, thank you for having me, Stacey. Thank you. That's great to know. And that's a fantastic resource to share. So thank you. You're welcome. That was one of the fastest podcasts I've ever had. I could have spoken to Laura for many, many more hours. There's so much to learn, and this is really just brushing the surface. But my hope for you is that it really helped guide you on those important key documents that you need to have in order to protect yourself and to protect your family. And part of that to make sure that you are financially secure and your loved ones are, is to make sure that your finances are in order. If you have any questions about what your portfolio is doing, if it's your invested the properly in the most robust way, or if you're on track financially to make sure that you can retire and live out your golden years to age 95 and beyond, both secure with having a lot of fun, please do reach out to me. My name is Stacy Francis, and you can reach me at Stacy S-T-A-C-Y, at FrancisFinancial.com. My favorite part of my job is to talk with people like you, to problem solve, to brainstorm, to wish, to dream, and most importantly, and make it a reality. So please do reach out. Thank you for joining us. And I'll be talking to you in two weeks. Thank you for tuning in to Financially Ever After Widowhood. If there's a question you'd love for us to answer on the podcast, we can do that for you. All you have to do is give us a call. And the number is 347 682-5580. Let me say that again. 347-682-5580. Whether you're working with an advisor or you're maybe doing it on your own, we invite you to reach out to us at www.francisfinancial.com or you can email me at stacy, S-T-A-C-Y, at francisfinancial.com. Our hope is to be a resource for you to help you also find a great financial advisor, whether that be with our firm or one of our trusted colleagues. Please be sure to like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast and join us next time on Financially Ever After Widowhood.